afternoon. My name is Doris Donny, the chair of the Board of Trustees of the American University of Paris, and it is my very, very special pleasure to welcome you here today on this most important occasion of the inauguration of the 13th president of the American University of Paris, Madame Sonia Claire Stevens. On behalf of my fellow trustees, I extend our warmest welcome to former trustees of the American College of Paris, current trustees of the American University of Paris, former chairs of the Board of Trustees, former AUP presidents, Mr. Lee Kiebner, and most recently and most appreciatively, Madame Celeste Schenk, honored guests, members of the faculty and administration, students, parents, families, alumni, distinguished members of the 7th arrondissement, and American institutions in Paris, neighbors and friends of AUP, thank you so much for joining us here today. Our university celebrated its 60th anniversary this past spring, and being here today to welcome its 13th president in the American church in Paris, the very first sight of our inaugural classes prompts us to appreciate how far we have come since 1962 and how courageously we have worked together to become the oldest American style institution of higher learning in Europe and to be recognized as a premier university of American style liberal arts in France right here in the center of Paris in the 7th arrondissement. Our mission to provide student-centered, academically rigorous, career-enabling, and transformative experience in order to launch graduates who will assume their place as responsible actors and leaders is supported by all of you here, AUP's talented faculty and dedicated staff, our adventurous students, and its supportive and generous and aware parents, enthusiastic alumni, remarkable donors, and those who provide AUP with their committed engagement in the ongoing quest to uphold its ambition and values. We thank you. As we move forward with energy, passion, and realistic optimism, we are grateful and proud and excited to be connected to you, all of you. You are our community. This inauguration begins the next decisive chapter in AUP's fierce and vibrant future under the leadership of Sonia Stevens. We welcome her to our intent. Broken down and tired of living life on a merry-go-round, and you can't find the fire turn, but I see it in you, so we gon' walk it out and move mountains. We gon' walk it out and move. And I'll rise up high like the day. I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid. I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. And I'll rise up high like the waves. I'll rise up in spite of the ache. I'll rise up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. Silence isn't quiet, it feels 
feels like it's getting hard to breathe And I know you feel like dying But I promise we'll take the world to its feet And move mountains Bring it to its feet And move mountains And I'll rise up, rise like the dead Paris has a way of belonging to everyone, said Stanley Stewart of the Financial Times this morning. It becomes a setting for some part of our lives, and we store those memories like treasure. Paris is central to the narrative of AUP, and no less so here in the beautiful 7th arrondissement of this great city. We are proud and grateful to be part of the 7th arrondissement et ceux qui nous ont accompagnés très fidèlement <laughs> pendant notre parcours, et j'affirme particulièrement le soutien apporté par la maire et conseillère de Paris du 7e, Madame Rachida Dati. Madame Dati, maire élue deux fois depuis son première élection en 2014, nous a fortement soutenus à chaque étape de notre croissance ici dans le 7e, à l'ouverture de notre Learning Commons Quai d'Orsay et aussi l'ouverture du Centre de Beaux-Arts rue Montessori. Nous sommes très reconnaissants de son appui privilégié et ardemment apprécié. Madame Dati est aussi une active présidente du groupe Changer Paris qui se veut d'apporter une vision optimiste à la réflexion écologique. Nous nous, nous nous inscrivons également dans une démarche tournée vers le futur, tout en conservant son patrimoine. C'est sur ces valeurs communes que j'invite Madame Dati, la maire, à nous joindre sur scène. Merci infiniment pour ces mots très aimables. Madame la Présidente, Mesdames et Messieurs, tout d'abord, je suis très honorée, vous le savez, d'être à vos côtés euh, aujourd'hui et comme je le suis euh, depuis toujours et depuis notamment mon élection dans cet arrondissement depuis 2008. Je suis très fière d'être dans cette église historique, à la fois pour les Parisiens mais aussi pour une université. D'ailleurs, la dernière fois où je suis venue ici, c'est parce que ma fille chantait dans une chorale quand je, dans cette église. Alors, en effet, en 1962, quand elle s'appelait encore l'American College in Paris, les premières salles de classe se trouvaient ici, dans une salle au sein de l'église américaine. Donc, c'est en quelque sorte un retour là où tout a commencé. Depuis, votre université s'est considérablement développée et j'ai pu y assister, j'allais le dire très modestement également, y contribuer parce que je tenais absolument à ce que cette institution puisse se développer dans ce bel écran qui est le 7e arrondissement. 
C'est une véritable institution du monde universitaire, mais aussi pour les Américains. Elle dispose à présent d'un campus de qualité qui répond à ses ambitions et lui permet d'accueillir dans de très bonnes conditions les étudiants. Sachez-le, de nombreux étudiants, et nous en connaissons beaucoup à Paris, seraient ravis de pouvoir étudier dans ces conditions-là, je vous le dis. Alors cette cérémonie marque l'arrivée de votre nouvelle présidente, euh, que je souhaite féliciter une nouvelle fois, Madame Stephens. Votre parcours incarne l'excellence. Elle incarne l'excellence, euh, cette excellence à laquelle je suis extrêmement attachée, vous le savez. Vous êtes aussi un symbole de la francophilie et de la francophilie américaine. Depuis votre adolescence, vous avez développé une impressionnante maîtrise de la langue française, j'en dirai pas autant en ce qui me concerne pour la langue anglaise, ou américaine, mais c'est un véritable amour de la France. Et avec vous, cette belle institution et ses étudiants sont entre de très bonnes mains. En tant que maire, en tant que parisienne également, je vous souhaite le meilleur, et le meilleur pour vous, et le meilleur pour nous tous ensemble. Mais cette cérémonie offre aussi une nouvelle occasion de célébrer l'amitié qui unit notre université, votre université, au 7e arrondissement car depuis 60 ans, et vous l'avez rappelé, vous faites partie intégrante de ce bel arrondissement. Et restez-y. Vous avez su conserver l'identité unique de votre université. Vous avez su vous épanouir ici, à Paris, au cœur d'une ville et d'un arrondissement largement ouvert à toutes les cultures. Et vous êtes bien entouré, notamment avec l'ensemble des musées ouverts sur le monde qui vous entoure. Étudiez à Paris, ville d'art, ville de culture, ville de gastronomie, Ville d'Histoire est une chance unique que chacun de vos étudiants sait apprécier. Et parmi vos 20 000 anciens étudiants, nombreux sont ceux qui ont ensuite leur, lancé leur carrière à Paris et qui aiment y revenir très régulièrement. Alors, chers amis, les membres des étudiants de cette université seront toujours les bienvenus à Paris et en particulier dans le 7e arrondissement. La mairie du 7e, le maire que je suis, la parisienne que je suis, et grande ouverte pour vous présenter et développer les projets qui vous tiennent à cœur et qui permettront de faire rayonner cette très belle et excellente institution. Donc soyez-en assurés, je serai toujours à vos côtés, je me sentirai toujours un peu chez moi ici, comme vous êtes totalement chez vous dans ce bel arrondissement et plus largement à Paris. Je vous remercie. Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Routier, class of 1994 and current member of the AUP Board of Trustees. On behalf of the 20,000 plus strong global alumni community, Sonia, I am honored to welcome you to AUP as our lucky 13th university president. When AUP was founded, Lloyd de Lamata, our founding president, set out to provide students with an education that would expand their minds and attitudes beyond the confines of narrow nationalism. 60 years later, we acknowledge the enduring value of his vision as we circumnavigate a world which, while growing ever more interconnected through economics and communications, is challenged by the false division of us versus them. Against this backdrop, it is an honor and a humbling moment to be here with you today at the American Church of Paris the home of our university's modest beginnings and in the place where my own relationship at the school formerly known as the American College of Paris began, below deck in the church's basement. When we speak of AUP, we focus on the most obvious evidence of our global heritage. Ours is a thriving body of alumni, more than 20,000 to be pseudo precise, living and working around the world, comfortable making our lives and professions in countries, 145 and counting, beyond the borders of our citizenship. Or we speak of the multiple language spoken among our alumni ranks, too many to count. Handy if you want to hide your country of origin, it can happen to the best of us. Every university experience leaves an indelible imprimatur on the students who are taught and shaped by the faculty, staff, and administration of their institution. For we AUPers, this exceptional institution along the banks of the Seine 
not only strengthens our understanding that diversity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging are non-negotiable. It is the essence of all who pass through our doors. We hone the skill of looking beyond where do you come from to focus on individuals and our ideas, to stretch ourselves and create a more expansive view of the world and our places in it. Whether you are a member of the inaugural graduating class of 1964 or a recent 2022 graduate, we share the same DNA. We are profoundly curious about the world, its people and cultures, we appreciate and celebrate differences, and we have an innate ability to see the world from a multitude of perspectives. I'm a young board member, some may say in all senses of the word, and one of my first assignments was on the search committee for our new president. During this process, I queried President Stevens about topics of importance, not just to AUP, but this moment in time and our responsibility as an institution of higher learning to prepare young people for an unknown future. I was struck by Sonia's views on liberal arts education, her deep and abiding love for France, and her deep desire to steward the university as it continues to evolve into the preeminent institution of higher learning AUP is destined to be. In those moments, I was thunderstruck. She is one of us. She is innately curious. She recognizes the inherent humanity in our differences, and she brings a distinct and refreshing breadth of experience, awareness we need as we commence a new chapter. With President Stevens at AUP Helm, we welcome her leadership in continuing to shape the young minds of students who grace these halls, equipping our global explorers with essential tools that transition us to global citizens and leaders in ways that AUP is uniquely able to do. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Elena Berg, and I am a science professor at AUP. Um, I also direct our Environmental Science Research Center. Um, and I recently became chair of the Department of Computer Science, Math, um, and Environmental Science, which, whew, becoming chair has been quite the feat this semester. There's a few, a few newbies at the helm. Um, I'm honored to be here with all of you today uh, to welcome AUP's 13th president, again, our lucky 13, Dr. Sonia Stevens. Welcome to our community, President Stevens. Without a doubt, my favorite part of working at AUP is interacting with its wonderful faculty, staff, and students who come from all over the world, speak, as we've already heard, many, many languages, and bring an incredible diversity of lived experiences to the table. We offer our students an American-style liberal arts education, uh, but we're not in the United States, and many of us are not American. I spent years at research universities where I interacted almost solely with my fellow evolutionary biologists who did exactly what I did and spoke in a very peculiar, jargon-ridden language. But here at AUP, in the course of a normal workday, I interact not only with members of my own department, but with colleagues in comparative literature, communications, anthropology, politics, history, economics, business, psychology, gender studies, art and art history, French, um, to name a few. And my world is not bounded by my fellow professors alone. Every day brings opportunities to collaborate and socialize with staff and students. We're a small, vibrant group of colorful and engaging people who defy any attempt to be put into neat and tidy boxes. This is what makes this place so incredibly special. Despite global pandemics, social unrest, and whatever else life throws our way, we continue to care about each other and about the work that we do together. Last summer, I was asked to join the search committee to help select our next president. And I was deeply curious about this process, but also unsure how we would know when we found the right person. Over the months that followed, we combed through many, many excellent applications. Um, but really, from the very moment that we met President Stevens uh, virtually over Zoom, which is not, not the ideal way to meet somebody for the first time, nevertheless, something clicked. Uh, and I felt absolutely sure that we'd found our match. 
I could stand here and I could run through her accomplishments, which are considerable, but of course anyone can look those up. Instead, I thought I would share two moments with President Stevens that helped shape my profound respect for her. During her interview, President Stevens lit up the room. Again, that's kind of a, a, a sort of a cliche statement, but it was really absolutely the case. Even over Zoom, she shone. She was confident, poised, and gracious. She interviewed us just as much as we interviewed her. <laughs> Kept us on our toes. But what uh, impressed me most was her ability to listen. She listened to what we had to say about our particular institution and our specific goals and needs and our challenges, and her answers and her questions reflected that. And then, in the spring, when she visited our campus, um, faculty were invited to meet her at an event at the Montessui Auditorium. She introduced herself briefly, but she did not give a long speech or tell us what she could do for us. Instead, she spent her hour on the stage taking our questions. She wanted to hear from us. Her ability to listen to people and to respond accordingly is a rare and deeply valuable skill. AUP is an extraordinary place, and we all have a lot to say that deserves hearing. And President Stevens is listening. So welcome to AUP. on a leash. Looks like. Came back for a little bit more. About a girl I know She's my baby And I love her so Every morning When the sun's coming up Pours me coffee In my favorite cup And now I know Yes I know Hallelujah I love her so sinking low I call my baby on the telephone but by the time I count one to four she'll be knocking on my door and then I know yes I know hallelujah I love her so Tough act to follow. Oscar Padula, everybody. He's incredible. 
Um, so hi everyone, thank you for being here today. My name is Darcy Karen. I am the director of the AUP Center for Academic Career and Experiential Advising and graduate alumna, class of 2013. When I was asked to speak today on behalf of AUP staff, at this the inauguration of President Sonia Stevens, I was so surprised. <laughs> I am humbled and so grateful to be speaking here today. As I prepared this greeting, I wondered what could I say to our new president about life as an AUP staff member that she had not yet heard or didn't already know? And then I wondered, what would my colleagues wish me to say? So with that in mind, President Stevens, I'd like to share with you three reflections that represent my roughly seven years of lived and observed experience as an AUP staff member. I hope that in offering you these reflections, maybe I save you some time. So here we go. Um, the first reflection, President Stevens, that I'd like to share with you is that AUP staff are not like staff at your typical university. This is thanks to the environment in which we work. We communicate daily in a multitude of languages. We transact in multiple currencies. We collaborate with the knowledge that our interlocutors and constituents carry with them cultural backgrounds, assumptions, and expectations which necessitate from us a constant and very high level of cultural fluency. We are cut from a different cloth, we staff at AUP. We are not copy pasters who, with little to no deviation, follow well-articulated workflows and processes, no. We are troubleshooters, problem solvers, and innovators. We know that every day and every case will be different and we thrive in this context that demands that we are ever on our toes and ready for the next novel challenge. If we have not yet already, President Stevens, your AUP staff will surprise you time and again. The second reflection that I'd like to share with you by way of greeting is that the American University of Paris has a very important educational mission, as we all know, and I think my colleagues would want you to know that those of us who have the very good fortune of being in contact directly with our students, we share the strong conviction that we contribute directly to the education of our students. The densely diverse nature of AUP is singular. And as such, here, perhaps more than anywhere else, learning is happening inside and outside of the classroom. Staff whose work puts them in touch with students are deeply committed to their contributions to student learning at AUP and take those contributions incredibly seriously. Beyond edu AUP's educational mission, our various departments and units seek to attain a variety of objectives and goals. And so when I was asked to give this address, I took a look at the unit mission statements that I could get my hands on uh, thinking I might find some inspiration, a common thread, and I did. Um, the mission statements all spoke to a strong desire to support through empowerment. Staff at AUP seek to empower their constituents, whomever they may be, be they students or colleagues or alumni or parents or members of the board. There's a tremendous amount of goodwill amongst staff at AUP, which is reflected in how we articulate our roles. And then finally, President Stevens, I believe my colleagues would want me to say to you that we are here at AUP because we want to be here. We are not here because we don't speak French, most of us do, and many other languages. We're not here because we lack an education. Many of us have one or more master's degrees and some of us a PhD. We're not here due to AUP's glittering postal code either. Most of us are long established in Paris. We are here rather because something about AUP feels like home. We are here because the work that we're doing aligns with our personal values and it feels incredibly meaningful. We're here because we choose AUP. So thank you so much for choosing AUP. I sincerely hope you will continue to choose AUP for many years to come and I hope that if it does not yet already, that AUP will soon feel very much like home for you as well. Thank you.
Good afternoon, honored guests. I'm Harris Soisal, the undergraduate student council president. And I'm Dominic Spada, the graduate student council president. And together, we, we are, are the, the new, new president's, president's biggest, biggest nightmare. nightmare. <laughs> we are immensely honored to be here today on behalf of the students at the American University of Paris to welcome our new president, Sonia Stevens. All three of us have one single thing in common. We are all new presidents, and we have no idea what we are doing. Um, excuse me, Dominic, speak for yourself. Thank you. Anyway, this year is a new beginning for all of us, uh, for us just as it is for you, President Stevens. For many of us in the graduate programs, we're embarking on new paths in our lives. For many of us returning students, our experience here has been once scrutinized by the COVID-19 pandemic. But this year, we have come to AUP, reborn and ready to take on a different yet exciting new experience. And, and we, we are, are thrilled, thrilled to have, have you along, along for the ride. ride. I came to AUP in 2019. Yes, I'm a senior on the way out. But before I say farewell, I think it is only fair that I give you, Sonia Stevens, an AUP starter pack. So here we go. Number one. Do not go to the Amex in between periods. You won't receive any food, and you'll be late to everything for the rest of the day. Number two, the entrance to the Saint Dominique building is actually on Passage d'Andrieux. You're welcome in advance. <laughs> and number three, Marc Montéard does not want to see you, no matter what time of day it is. <laughs> if you are aware of those three things, I'm pretty sure you'll thrive at AUP. <laughs> But all jokes aside, we are very excited to have your light and warm energy to fill the halls of AUP and inspire students to take on grand initiatives on and off of this campus. Here today, we celebrate the beginning of your time at AUP. New, begin new beginnings are new opportunities for new initiatives. We're pushing ourselves into new endeavors towards our futures. I have started a new program three times now at EUP. First as a partner student, then as a transfer student, and now as a master's student. At its core, to me, AUP presents new opportunities on a platter for its students, allowing us to pursue, pursue them with, uh, with flexibility and with passion to create the futures that we desire. In this moment, President Stevens, AUP is your new endeavor, and you are ours. On both sides, we have boundless opportunities for the future to form our, the institution to our visions. For us in the short term as we advance towards our careers and for you, a vision far beyond our time here at AUP. We welcome this opportunity to begin our partnership together. As student council presidents, we relish in this opportunity to be the first collaborators to work with you in your time here. We come into this partnership confident with each other and our abilities to, to put our goals and visions into action. I remember something you said to me the first time that we met, that the university keeps moving, even though as individuals, but then it change. Today, you commence that change, creating a legacy that will far outlast any of our times here. Thank you. And have a wonderful evening. <laughs>
after that, I feel I have nothing to say. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames, messieurs, can I start off by saying what a pleasure it is and indeed an honor to be invited to say a few words on this special occasion celebrating for both her and the institution, Sonia Stevens' appointment as president of the American University in Paris. I have known Sonia for 37 years, and I think there are only a couple of people here who have known her longer, her proud parents and one other person. So I've known her for half my life and two thirds of hers. And I sometimes feel that the only bit I missed out on was her childhood and perhaps less pleasurably her adolescence. <laughs> it is testimony to her loyalty and capacity for friendship that I stand here this afternoon. That it should be Sonia herself who invited me rather than countless other friends or colleagues equally qualified to speak also testifies, I think, to another of her innumerable personal qualities, namely her courage. <laughs> How many of us would have the courage, precisely, to risk being reminded in public of the first let us say, less than fulsome first grade that they received from a former teacher. I won't embarrass Sonia, except by recalling that my scrawled comment at the bottom of her first piece of work read something like, room for improvement. But the context, long ago, is also revealing. It was as a senior, in US terms, that Sonia asked whether she could join my freshman class in order to enhance her translation skills in anticipation of her final degree examinations. And nobody, I should add, nobody before and nobody since during my teaching career ever had the gall to follow her bold example. And what that very first encounter with Sonia left me with was a powerful sense of her modesty, making such a unique request in the first place, and her relentless commitment to excellence, a desire and a drive inspired by ambitions for herself and for others in due course, for students, for colleagues, and the institutions she has served. Sonia has had a glittering career. As many of you know, as the program uh, articulates, and as indeed you can find out on the net. Once upon a time, I was senior to her as her professor, as her head of department, when her embryonic curriculum vitae was not as voluminously distinguished as it is today. Now, I am merely a senior citizen, <laughs> marveling in retrospect at what this former undergraduate has since achieved. A brilliant Cambridge track record, a prestigious Commonwealth scholarship to Canada, where she took a master's at the University de Montréal, a lectureship at the University of Manchester, tenure as a full professor at Royal Holloway in the University of London, where she was head of the French department and of the School of Modern Languages, Literatures and Cultures, chair of the Department of French and Italian at the University of Indiana at Bloomington, and vice provost for undergraduate education, vice president for academic affairs and dean of the faculty at Mount Holyoke, and subsequently first acting president, and then confirmed as the president of that world-renowned liberal arts college. 
And that's not all. Administrative and motivating leadership, il va sans dire. But also, at the same time, and literally at the same time, a scholar with books and other publications to her name responsible for an international reputation as a 19e East, a properly senior figure in her field, regularly invited to academic conferences all over the globe. And let us not forget, as a teacher, and a formidable one, and an inspiring one at that, demanding, inclusive, and supportive of the young. I remember that when she was a member of my department, all colleagues had a timetabled hour when students could come to talk about their courses, their queries, their problems and challenges. But it was only outside Sonia's office door that the corridor was absolutely crowded with students patiently waiting their turn for a slice of her kindness and warmth and wisdom. The word had got around the student community that Sonia was the member of the staff one had to see for encouragement, elucidation, and the strategies for self-improvement of which she herself is a role model. Well might we ask how Sonia has achieved all this. One could refer to her people skills, her networking talents, her analytical intelligence, her incredible capacity for sheer hard work, her energy, her stamina. And I could go on. And it's actually all too much, isn't it? Even by the hyperbolic standards of American letters of recommendation, <laughs> in which we more cynical Brits cannot find between the lines anything, ju just a hint, which mildly detracts from the message that every candidate for appointment is a paragon. Is there not one tiny flaw in this record of perfection? To that end, <laughs> I can only remember one instance. Back in 1994, when Sonia and I crossed the Atlantic together, heading for an academic conference at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And you have to be familiar with West Coast geography to appreciate this particular anecdote. So there we were. We got to LA. We hired a sports car. <laughs> we had the roof down. We were both young. We had rock music blaring out of the car. intending to head up Highway 1 from Los Angeles with me driving and Sonia as a kind of sat-nav with a nicer voice. It was magic. The Pacific was shimmering in the sunshine. And after about an hour, I said to Sonia, shouldn't the ocean Shouldn't the ocean be on our left? <laughs> Not a problem. Putative destination Mexico, <laughs> abandoned. We did an about turn. The serious point of which is that Sonia is not dogmatic or inflexible. Unlike Mrs. Thatcher, <laughs> who famously declared that the lady is not for turning, Sonia has that ability to think quickly, well, at least after an hour, <laughs> on her feet or in the passenger seat, and do an about turn and head in the right direction. 
that she can still laugh today about our ludicrous ineptitude 30 years ago. She is far too, dis too discreet to claim that it was my fault because I turned to the right coming out of LA airport. It points to something, I think, something more important than her other gifts, and that is her sense of humor. The absolute sine qua non of surviving the pressures of contemporary professional life, or what has been referred to in previous public tributes as Sonia's big laugh, which speaks of her being grounded, I think, as is also indicated by her rich family life, the necessary counterbalance to the stresses and strains of work. That sense of humor figures in the valedictory tribute to Sonia from the chair of trustees of Mount Holyoke, which I have been privileged to read. And there is no disguising within the inventory of her accomplishments at Mount Holyoke of her nine years there, culminating in a much admired presidency. That it's not disguised, or at least it's, there's a barely disguised disappointment that she is moving on to pastures new. But there is also in that tribute a gracious acknowledgement that, quote unquote, the unique nature of a Paris-based liberal arts college speaks to both her scholarly interests in French literature and her skills as an academic leader. There is more to it than that, I think, for in many ways, as her, I mean, there's references to her fluent French, get it straight, it's immaculate, immaculate spoken and written French. But it adds to such a sense that this appointment represents both a personal and intellectual return to Sonia's pays d'élection. It remains for me by way of conclusion to congratulate on her appointment, both Sonia and the American University of Paris itself, to which she brings her vast experience, her properly international credentials, the UK, France, Canada, the USA, and a vision of the educational horizons to which the next generation must aspire. In these times of unprecedented challenges and fast-moving academic contexts, appointing her as your next president is itself a visionary decision. Cometh the hour, cometh Sonia Stevens. Thank you very much. That was irresistible. We have to do the investiture now. <laughs> and in fact, there is a way of doing this. Sonia, may I ask you to come up? Thank you. Thank you. This ceremonial scepter symbolizes the authority of the office of the president on behalf of the board of trustees I present you, Sonia Stevens, 13th President of AUP, with the symbol of the Office of the Presidency. This representation of office marks your formal investiture as President of the American University of Paris. And if you hand it to you, you can admire it, then you can hand it back to me. <laughs> I'm not leaving. <laughs> Thank you all. I'm going to add my thanks if you'll bear with me a moment. Chair of the Board of Trustees, Doris Dorney, current and former trustees, former AUP presidents, 
elected officials in government and municipal representatives, distinguished guests and colleagues, AUP's extraordinary faculty, staff, students and their families, and especially those students who spoke and performed today. In fact, all of the speakers, thank you. My family and my friends. It, it, it is with deep gratitude for your confidence and support and in admiration for and celebration of the American University of Paris that I accept this charge to serve as its 13th president. I'm cognizant of the responsibilities that this represents and of the honor to be in the service of this remarkable institution and, and all of its members. And I'm so grateful for your presence here today as I formally take office. It is especially moving to be invested with these responsibilities in this place of devotion, the American Church in Paris, where as you've already heard, our founder Lloyd Delamater rented rooms, both here in the basement um, and uh, next door actually at number 63 Quai d'Orsay 2, and in partnership also with the American Cathedral in Paris and the American Library in Paris, envisioned and launched the first university in Europe based on an American liberal arts education combined with a rich cultural program. Et je vais le faire en français aussi, si vous, vous le permettez. Président du conseil d'administration de Donné, membre actuel et ancien du conseil, ancien président des UP, élu et représentant de gouvernement et de municipalité, collègues et invités distingués, étudiants et anciens élèves extraordinaires des UP, et surtout ceux qui ont participé à cette cérémonie, leurs familles, et enfin, ma famille et mes amis, c'est avec une profonde gratitude pour votre confiance et votre soutien et dans l'admiration et la célébration de l'Université américaine de Paris que j'accepte et j'assume cette charge d'en être la 13e présidente. Je suis consciente des responsabilités que cela représente et de l'honneur d'être au service de cette remarquable université et de ses membres. Et je suis très reconnaissante de votre présence ici aujourd'hui alors que je prends officiellement mes fonctions. C'est particulièrement émouvant d'être investi de ces responsabilités dans ce lieu, the American Church in Paris, où notre fondateur, Lloyd de Lamata, a trouvé un lieu et des locaux pour donner libre essor à son imagination et en partenariat avec the American Cathedral in Paris and the American Library in Paris, a conçu et lancé ici dans le 7e arrondissement, voire ici même sur le Quai d'Orsay, la première université d'Europe basée sur une formation en art libéraux américaine ainsi qu'un riche programme culturel. Je vous remercie de votre présence ici aujourd'hui et de la profonde amitié dont vous témoignez pour the American University of Paris. 60 years on, the American University in Paris has proven its resilience and remains true to Dr. Delamater's vision in its broad educational purpose and its mission to be, I quote, the best preparation for the international world, a place to bridge the gap, as we heard, of narrow nationalisms, to provide an education, and I quote, for motivated, world-minded students delivered by a first-class, a world-class faculty. Now, two images in Dr. Delamater's account of the founding years of the American College in Paris strike me on this, the threshold of the university's next decade and beyond. The first is to mention his choice, not to mention the permission he secured to use the Blason de Paris, or the city's coat of arms, as the college's first seal, stamped upon the catalogue. The second, his image of the enterprise he was determined to launch as a bumblebee, ill-adapted to flight, seemingly defying the principles of aerodynamics. These two images perhaps related by, at least for him, a conjoined, in fact, in the 1811 Napoleonic version of the city's coat of arms, uh, which replaces the fleur de lis of earlier versions with bumblebees. Now, the Paris coat of arms that Lloyd de Lamata impressed upon that first course catalog was not this one, but the 1853 version with a medieval phrase in Latin, fluctuat nec mergitur, a dicton long associated with Paris, and a reference, of course, to the ship of the seal that endures through its various versions from the 14th century, representing the trade of the Paris water merchants. 
This dicton, added by Baron Haussmann, evoked the flooding of the city over centuries, and of course, both then and now, the resilience of the city and its inhabitants in the face of change, as well as the challenges and assaults endured. With that first catalog, its trickler cover evoking both France and the United States, ancient prints and an aerial view of the, of the city included, the visual identity and the union between this university and its host city was quite literally sealed. Now, I feel sure that quite apart from the great union Dr. Delamater envisioned between this university and the city in which it was founded and continues to thrive, he was launching it with the confidence that while like Paris, it might be tossed by the waves, agité par les vagues, it would always remain afloat. Ne sombrerait pas. Ne sombrerait pas. This was in no small part a result of his own zeal, determination, industriousness, and benevolence, the very qualities symbolized by Napoleon's bees, resulting in the conviction that with the right conditions, and as it turns out, the right conditions for bees are mini vortices, the right with the right conditions and with the labor of love that he brought to it, the noble idea that founded the American University of Paris would indeed take flight. Over the last 60 years, many others, including many of you present today, have joined in this quest to shape a university true to that vision and yet changed by the demands of each generation to found and refound a university that is entering its seventh decade stronger and more vital than ever and motivated by an international mission that is not only still relevant, but an imperative. As I reflected on the concurrence of images in this union between the university and Paris, other texts and images, of course, came to mind. For as Priscilla Parkhurst Ferguson argued, no city exists apart from the multitude of discourses that it prompts. Topography is textuality. Ferguson also writes that names like coats of arms crystallize identity. More or less obviously, they fit within a larger system of representations through which the collectivity defines itself to itself and to the world beyond. And while she focuses on the relationship between the city, its planners, its texts and intertexts, we can say that colleges and universities like cities take on and shape their own identities through place and space, through the work of many hands and minds, through ambition that may seem to be authorial, but which develops according to its interpreters, which unfolds through long and often painful processes of creation, accommodating change and new users, always palimpsestic, and in perpetual dialogue with itself, with its place and space, and with others, redefining itself as both a locus of reflection and critical inquiry and as a creative enterprise. Now, I choose these metaphors and associations not randomly, but to create a clear connection between our founding moment and this moment, between our place in Paris and this seventh arrondissement, between our own evolving learning spaces and opportunities that being a global community in the heart of Paris represent today. Baudelaire, in describing the experience of the flaneur in 19th century Paris, turns to an image that seems also to describe the scholarly enterprise of the liberal arts and the kaleidoscopic and electrically charged community that we are at AUP, both in and of Paris. And with, with, in begging your forgiveness, I'm gonna read only the translation of that passage to, for, in the interest of time. For the perfect flaneur, for the passionate spectator, it is an immense joy to set up house in the heart of the multitude or the crowd. Amid the ebb and flow of movement, in the midst of the fugitive and the infinite, to be away from home and yet to feel oneself everywhere at home. To see the world, to be at the center of the world and yet to remain hidden from the world. Such are a few of the slightest pleasures of those independent, passionate, impartial natures which the tongue can but clumsily define. Thus. The lover of universal life enters into the crowd as though it were an immense reservoir of electrical energy. Or we might liken him to a mirror as vast as the crowd itself, or to a kaleidoscope, gifted with consciousness, responding to each one of its movements and reproducing the multiplicity of life 
and the flickering grace of all of the elements of life. For Baudelaire, these signs and images form a great repository to be absorbed, reinvented, transformed by the imagination in the shaping of something new. A city like Paris, then as now, is not reducible to its name and its parts, nor fully attainable in the sum of these. Similarly, the work of a university of this university is not wholly represented by its name or its location, but rather is kaleidoscopically dynamic, ever-changing. These entities are, as Hope Merely's um, modernist poem Paris show us, polyphonic, polymorphous, polysemic. As Merely's walks the city on one day in 1919 during the Paris Peace Conference, she experiences, as you may have today or this week, um, the silence of la grève. Rain, the Louvre melting into mist, the Seine meandering imperturbably towards the sea, ruminating on weeds and rain, and the Eiffel Tower, two-dimensional, etched on thick white paper. Immersed in its sights and sounds, she, takes, she shapes a text to evoke such simultaneous experiences and to capture the multiple perspectives she adopts in relation to them. So while our name and our place here identify us and bind us together into Paris, they stand more as an invitation. An invitation much like Merley's text, an invitation to an intricate intellectual labyrinth narrativizing, narrativizing history and present moment, knowledge and approaches, disciplines, engaging our environment and the experience of AUP, concurring in the creation of new opportunities and new visions, overwriting with new texts and intertexts and new layers of the palimpsest shaping new and ever-changing iterations of this university and its kaleidoscopic offerings and motivating our evolving communities of thinkers and doers. I choose these metaphors because it is, it is the work of the liberal arts, of a liberal arts education, to discover and pursue such connections and analogies, to recognize the multiplicity and creativity within its communities and continually and consistently to question and reinvent itself. It is the role of a liberal arts education to do exactly what Delamat, I believe, had in mind, that is, in the words of William Cronin, to nurture human freedom and growth, to enable others to take flight. For Cronin, the heart of a liberal education in its contemporary expression is an expansive and inclusive dream that one day everyone might someday be liberated by an education that stands in the service of human freedom. Cronin associates 10 attributes with a liberally educated person, all of which speak to the university we are today, as well as to the highest values that must continue to underpin our aspirations. He says, this isn't a quote, it's paraphrase. Liberally educated people listen, hear, and learn from others and demonstrate empathy. They embody curiosity, they read and they understand. And they can talk with anyone because curiosity and empathy translate into a keen interest in others and in their humanity. Liberally educated people, Cronin continues, can also express themselves in ways that persuade, reach and touch others. And I think we've seen and heard that today. They are problem solvers and know how to use rigorous analytical skills in the pursuit of truth and in the service of values that advance society and humanity. They understand how to get things done in the world and they use their knowledge to leave it a better place, nurturing and empowering those around them. Two further attributes in particular stand out to me as being especially important to our mission and purpose as the American University of Paris. First, Cronin's seventh attribute. They practice humility, tolerance, and self-criticism, Cronin writes. And this is a quotation from him. This is another way of saying that they can understand the power of other people's dreams and nightmares as well as their own. They have the intellectual range and emotional generosity 
to step outside their own experiences and prejudices, thereby opening themselves to perspectives different from their own. From this commitment to tolerance flow all those aspects of a liberal education that oppose parochialism and celebrate the wider world. Without such encounters, we cannot learn how much people differ and how much they have in common. Here more than anywhere, perhaps we see the founding ideal of AUP, the idea, as Delamata wrote, of deprovincializing fine young students and offering a meaningful international education experience, simultaneously valuable and unique. A community of human beings such as ours places international and diverse perspectives, collaboration and cooperation at the forefront of inquiry and the dialogue about our collective humanity and our shared future. This is made possible by all of the other conditions, aspirations and expectations of this education and by the global and multicultural demography of this community here at AUP and across Paris one of the most culturally diverse cities in Europe. It is made possible too by the power of connection. And this is Cronin's final summative attribute of a liberally educated person, the ability to see connections. More than anything else, he argues, being an educated person means being able to see connections that allow one to make sense of the world and act within it in creative ways. A liberal education is about gaining the power and the wisdom the generosity and the freedom to connect. AUP embodies that spirit of endless curiosity, learning and growth. It is the very desire and ambition to be greater than the sum of its parts and oneself, to contribute to something truly uncommon and imaginative, to connect in this university, great city and the world with each other, with ideas, with opportunity, with difference and not only to embrace change and difference, but to make such change and difference beyond this community through all that the human and intellectual connections here offer. Our future lies then in living these opportunities and commitments, in shaping them for others, and in, ma in imagining new ways to pursue and embody them. I could not be more committed to this endeavor nor more excited to do this work with you. As emboldened by the successes of the past, we give full flight to imagining together the next decades of the American University of Paris. Thank you. Thank you.